Before I forget, I just wanted to say, um, if you like that intro song, um, that is done by my good friend, Lee Pence. He is a musician, guitar player, and he played guitars on that track. And um, if you need any kind of music made, that's exactly what he does. He's his own recording studio. And check him out, leepence.net, um, or Google him. He's got a YouTube site also. So check him out. Um, he does really, really good work. So, um, Dr. Wallen, um, welcome back to our show. We're going to be talking about um, funding in a non funding of healthcare in a non traditional method. Um, I know we've been told that healthcare is super expensive, and you have to have this traditional health insurance because it saves us so much money, and we don't want to, you know, have cancer or um, have a heart attack and not have health insurance. So, you're going to tell us some non traditional ways to fund healthcare, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Good to see well, you guys. Yes. Well, welcome welcome to our show. And I'll just let you start by, you know, how did you get into to this role of um, funding healthcare in a different way? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the reality is, you know, I, I you know, we're all patients, right? At the end of the day, every every single human being on the on the planet is a, is a potential patient at some point in time. You know, I don't come from a lot of money. I leveraged, you know, half a million dollars in debt to to get through my medical training and such. And what I kind of realized and, and with my business training and, and kind of ability to see kind of see the, the greater picture type uh, situation, you know, I realized kind of what a scam was happening for, you know, individuals and families as far as, you know, traditional health insurance and, you know, kind of the deeper you dive into it. And, and for me, like, you know, I think just like most of the other healers that are out there, the other physicians and any, everybody else on the healthcare team, on the clinical team, you know, we got into this to help people, right? And, and so, you know, when you get there and then you realize you either can't help people because there's some corporation telling you you got to do something else because it's cheaper or, you know, whatever else, whatever other example you want to throw out there, you know, that makes it very uh, painful. And that's where you kind of hear maybe this term moral injury where, you know, you basically are trying to do your best as the clinician, but are limited by either monetary or, or regulation constraints by the systems. And, you know, that's where I think, I think from, from that standpoint, that pain for me really kind of just real, made me realize that number one, people don't have a great financial education in our country, but number two, when it comes to healthcare or medical care, that's that's significantly even further uh, down on the list of of you know strengths for for individual families. So that pain is what really kind of brought me through this passion to be a, a, a even more of a patient advocate and, and take the leap to to try to educate as many people as I can to, to with the tools that I know you know kind of to some extent from the backstage uh, viewpoint of things having been a patient, but also, you know, kind of seeing how it works as a clinician and trying to help people save thousands of dollars if they possibly can and, and get better care. Cause we all, we all know it's out there and, and, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but, you know, certainly, you know, the inflated costs of the system are largely created by so many middlemen that are there, whether it's health insurance or GPOs or PBMs, which you don't even really need to know what those terms mean, but, there's a, a significant amount of people pulling money from the system, and it's basically, to some extent, kind of robbing our individual paychecks if you're a, a W-2 employee as well. So, you know, from that standpoint, you know, wage growth, I think from, since the Affordable Care Act, wage growth has been about just under 10 percent, right, when you compare it to inflation. When you look at, you know, uh, premiums and deductibles, deductibles have risen 111 percent. Premiums are up 61 percent for families. And then you look at United Healthcare stock prices over that same time, and it's up sixteen hundred percent. And you kind of start to realize what the scam that's going on, and and just, I mean, really, that's that's crazy. And especially when you consider seventy, almost seventy percent, sixty nine percent of individual families have less than a thousand dollars in their bank account. Whereas you know these these high deductible health plans, you have to pay more and more in deductible before you actually get coverage. And most people can't even afford those deductibles based on the fact that they, they only have, you know, less than $1,000 in their bank account. So, you know, again, it's, it's trying to do whatever we can to serve the people that, that we're trying to serve, which for me, I got into medicine to serve, serve all the people I possibly could that needed help from, especially from a urologic standpoint, since I'm a urologic specialist. But, but in the reality, if I can't, if I can't even help them through the financial part of it, then you know, that's, that's difficult for them to chew on and, and access care, which, you know, again, uh, a lot of people love the Affordable Care Act, but I think there's a lot of problems with it. 
And one of them is that it mandated coverage. It didn't necessarily mandate care, which is really what you need, right? And so, you know, from that standpoint, trying to actually get people access and actual care, especially when we can deliver it in a, in a low cost manner to help them financially and, and protect that portion of it, you know, that's, that's where the Holy Grail is for me. So that's where, that's where taking that, all the pain that I had from, you know, kind of realizing what, how much of a scam the system is and, and really kind of seeing how I can benefit people. And, and I think that's where, you know, patients really need to be educated and empowered to be a consumer again of medical care because otherwise they're just getting taken advantage of. Yeah, for sure. So, Janet, you have any comments on that? That was a lot to it take in. It was a lot to unpack. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wallace. It was. But, you know, I, this morning when Sean and I were talking about um, you being a guest, Jared, or Dr. Wallen on our show, um, you know, the oxymoron of this is that really, at least 30 to 50 years ago, we weren't in this position. Right. Um, doctors and um, surgeons and physicians were all more in a control of our healthcare system. So do you perceive that as being one of the biggest problems? I mean, that's kind of how I identify it. But what is that really what's kind of driven us into the corner of not being able to, to provide that care? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the fact that uh, you know, again, as a W two employee, I'm I'm beholden to whoever is is you know the CEO or what have you. Back in the '80s and and prior to that, physicians were their own independent small businesses, right? And so then I'm the ultimate decision maker, not some business type or or what have you, or some ex clinician who's now a business type. And you know, over that time period. Uh, there's there's been multiple different pieces of legislation and, and the uh, citizen health group with um, John Chamberlain and Brennan Hodge, they've, they've made a nice graph where basically they document the legislation and they document the growth of administrators, which has been like 3,500% or no, excuse me, 4,500% growth in administrators since the 80s. So, you know, managers, middle managers, all these all these different mm -hmm. layers of, of management on for this corporate medicine conglomerate, right? Whereas physician growth is like a stagnant line at the bottom, and you see that you know the the cost has kind of mirrored the growth of administrators at thirty five hundred percent since then, and so you know not only does that drive up cost, and and I would personally argue at the end of the day, think about it, if you took away all those all those physicians, all one million of us in the country, or one million plus, I guess, but if you took us all away, none of those middle managers or management could actually deliver you any, any possible value mm -hmm. as a, as a consumer of medical care. And so, you know, from that standpoint, they're, they're telling me what to do when they don't even know what the best thing for the patient is based on mostly financial decisions. Right. But they're also, you know, essentially to some extent kind of controlling, you know, what I can and can't do or what, how I can and can't help patients. Not only that, but from a business standpoint, if I'm an independent physician practice, small business, I can say, hey, listen, I'm going to give you a discount or I'm going to, you know, comp your care. Whereas as a, as a W-2 employee, you just can't do that. And so, right. you know, that's where, I mean, even some of these non, uh, let me, let me make sure I get it right. These tax exempt, uh, nonprofit hospitals, nonprofit, right? Right. Um, <laughs> even some of them, I mean, they own collection companies. And right. so th it's crazy. I mean, look, uh, Marty McCary in his book, The Price We Pay, talked about how in the state of Virginia in 2017 alone, there was only 37% of the hospitals that actually sued patients. But of those, they filed 20,000 lawsuits in the year 2017 alone. And so, you know, from that standpoint, I'm not saying that we can comp everything. It's, it shouldn't be free. It can't be free because at the end of the day, somebody is paying for it, you know, whether that's out of tax dollars or what have you. We all have to, we talk about skin in the game and, and kind of taking accountability and responsibility for your health to some extent. But yeah, I mean, the, the corporatization of, of medical care has certainly not only disempowered patients, not only disempowered their clinicians, their healers, but it's, it's driven costs through the roof. Well, and, you know, the just because somebody is nonprofit doesn't mean that 
they're out there for the good of the patient. And like you say, they are suing patients. And it's like, they shouldn't maybe write everything off. I get that. But when the when the price is, is jacked up tenfold what it really should be, and they're sending patients to um, collection and, and suing them over their bill, um, there should be some kind of middle ground for sure, especially if they're doing this in the name of charity, which as... John Chamberlain will tell you, who is a former hospital administration, it has nothing to do with charity. It's all about bottom line to hospitals, profit, nonprofit, public, private. Um, they're pretty much all the same. Well, well and, those, and those nonprofit hospitals are supposed to be delivering more charity care, right? But those right. tax exempt hospitals, but they're actually delivering less than private and, and public hospitals. And on top of that, again, they're, they're, they're sending people collections. I would argue actually even more than 10x, 23x is. I think what Marty McCary mentioned in his book, The Price We Pay, and, and I mean, you, again, you think about that, if you have to pay 10% of $1,000, that's, that's pretty manageable, right? But if you're talking about the same service at $100,000, paying 10% of that, I mean, again, for most people, that's not even in their, in their realm of possibility. Right. And so that's where the markup, the markup discount game that a lot of retailers play is being played by insurances and, and, and hospitals together. They play this game together because they, they benefit. And, and not only that, remember, they're also hiding their prices, right? Because, I mean, yeah, there's been an executive order by Trump, which was reinforced by Biden. But ultimately, I think only like 14 percent of the people that are or of the hospitals that have been kind of reviewed in certain subsets of, of I think it was of a thousand hospitals by a pro right, uh, patient right advocate. I mean, only 14 percent are actually in compliance. And that's because they can make a heck of a lot more money by hiding their prices and jacking up the prices. And, and I mean, I think the, just a specific example, the, the Medicare allowable payment for a joint replacement is $13,000. There's one in six hospitals in the United States that are charging 90,000 plus. Oh. And, there's, and there's some that are charging 115,000 for it. And so again, uh, and, and the problem also is, uh, you know, again, there's, there's and medicine right now is anything but a free market. Right. And so, because of that, because of the regulations that are out there, the limiting of competition, you know, these, these big conglomerates, the, the big hospital systems, the big health insurance companies are, are able to kind of just take over the market and do what they want. Whereas if there was, if it was a free market and we could compete, I mean, certainly everybody would probably choose, you know, the, the lower cost if they could, if they understood what was going on. Right. For sure. Um, so Jan, do you have any questions on that? Well, I, I, I just have a comment to you as a, um, a doctor. How does it make you feel when you know that there is a specific treatment that's going to save the patient money and you're going to get to the root of the problem, but you have to go through all these other steps that cost more and you end up charging the client more when in the beginning you could have practiced the art that you were practicing and just take care of the problem immediately. I mean, how does that put you as, as a practicing other than, um, you know, just frustrated. I mean, what, what, tell us how that feels to you and what that does to your colleagues. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the definition of moral injury, right? If you really understand it, it's, it's truly us trying to do the best we possibly can for the patient but being significantly limited by the system. And that's why, I mean, physicians have double the suicide rate as the normal population. That's why there's oh. physicians that are burning out and, and yeah. getting out of medicine altogether because not only the financial part of it, because quite honestly, I would argue with you, a lot of the physicians, my colleagues don't know the financial part of it. They, don't, they haven't taken the steps to understand what the costs are for each thing, like a lot of the people who advocate for free markets do. But I mean, the reality is, is, is that, you know, there's so many, there's so many, I would say when I worked for a corporate hospital, I was handcuffed, I was gagged and I was, and I was, you know, to some extent kind of abused as far as trying to actually be able to help patients because it's, it's a, it's something that you take internally and it may, maybe nobody ever sees it on the outside, but it, it does, you know, each chip, right? Each, each time you chip away at the rock, the more you chip away, the less, the less healers have to give, right? And you have to be able to have good health and have good mental state to be able to give to others in the first place. And so if you're, if you're talking about a situation where you're kind of captive by the system as the, as the healer, as the clinician, it makes it so difficult to actually truly get out there and, and do the right thing for the patient. 
So we've identified the problems or some of the problems. And, you know, I mean, we hear people like yourself and many other physicians or people in healthcare complain about it. But you went a step further, Dr. Wallen, and you have some solutions. So what are those solutions? Right. So, I mean, I, I went ahead and created self-directed medical. Mainly it's an education program for patients because, again, that, that financial knowledge for medical care is not there. And, and I think the reality is that I got to stop saying that, but whatever. Um, it really truly is a problem of the corporate medical system, right? If you can get outside of that and still protect yourself as a patient, then you can achieve significantly lower prices and, you know, get the highest quality possible care that's out there. And so from that standpoint, you know, basically we, we kind of talk about five main pillars. One is, you know, your day-to-day -day care, which you know, there's direct primary care out there that which can offer a significant cost savings for folks. And it, it's as cheap as $1,000 a year for 24-7 access and access to, you know, some extra extra things on top of that, wholesale meds, wholesale labs, what have you, that can save even, even for Medicare patients. I talked to uh, a DPC down in Fort Myers the other day, uh, Dr. Rebecca Bernard, who I think has been on your show as well. Mm -hmm. And she was saying that, even for Medicare patients, she can actually save them money if if they if they join her direct primary care practice. Just you know, for instance, if they have you know four or five different medications that they're on, she can actually save them enough money that they pay for their membership just by you know getting them access to wholesale medications. And so from that standpoint, that's that's huge, you know, because again, Medicare, a lot of Medicare patients are limited in their ability to you know kind of generate extra revenue or what have you, and actually. Uh, there's some AARP data that shows that Medicare patients, the, the two of you together, you and Janet, when you get into Medicare years between, say, 65 and 85 or, or maybe even 95 plus, however long you live, between that 20 and 30 years plus, uh, most people will probably spend $230,000 to $340,000 out of pocket, out of pocket. And, and most people don't even have that saved for, right. for retirement alone, let alone for medical care specifically. And so if you can, you know, kind of do that or, you know, even just, I know, I know another friend of mine um, who has rheumatoid arthritis and he actually saves more money every month on his rheumatoid arthritis medication through his direct primary care than he does, uh, than, than what he pays for the membership. And that's just for one or two medications, I think, that he's Thank on. You. And so that's huge. Plus, plus also just think about it in, in just one instance, right? If you can call your direct primary care, if you got a cut in your hand, you can call them and you can avoid going to the emergency room because you have access. Again, not talking about coverage. We're talking about access and care, right. which is the most important piece. If you can call them, text them, telehealth anytime or, or even, you know, what have you and, and avoid going to the emergency room and avoid getting that 10 or $15,000 bill for sutures or what have you. I mean, that's huge. So, and, that, and that's just one, one example, one time. So, you know, that's, that's a huge pillar for day-to-day -day stuff. Beyond that, for, for catastrophic coverage, so, so we have to have day-to-day -day coverage. We have to have catastrophic coverage for those big costs like surgery, like, um, you know, admissions to the hospital, like emergency room visits, what have you. We also have to specifically talk about the four main things that, that uh, patients typically get robbed on and find wholesale prices for them, which, we'll, which I'll mention in a bit. But beyond that, I also there's also financial accelerators like HSAs, like HMAs that can be helpful for that out-of-pocket costs. And then finally, it's really just trying to be as healthy as you possibly can to stay the heck out of the system in the first place, which is the fifth pillar. But so we talked about direct primary care, those catastrophic costs. I mean, sharing programs are great for that for families and individuals and even small businesses. There's also level funded plans which uh, you know, can be helpful for kind of a little bit bigger businesses between 15 and 50 employees or so. And then beyond that, a lot of, a lot of businesses will actually self-direct their care and, and basically have a self-funded plan where they take on the risk rather than paying somebody else to. But you know, again, that, the, uh, if you can couple some of these things, especially direct primary care and sharing, I mean, sharing, sharing is a great opportunity to save about 50% of your health insurance bill and potentially even reduce your deductible to you know a thousand dollars or so, which you know again, if you if you can do that and save money, why not, right? I mean, I think there's a million people across the country in sharing programs right now, and I would argue that you know we would be a lot better off if there was you know 50 million or 100 million people across the country, or even 
you know, 300 million, all of us, if, if we could all get into a sharing program rather than these kind of mandated programs. I mean, even what Medicare Advantage and a lot of the Affordable Care Act uh, programs, they don't even include the best, the best doctors. They don't include the best cardiothoracic or, you know, the best cardiologists. They don't include the best oncology folks across the country. And if you have a real bad problem like cancer or, or heart disease, which is also common, I mean, I think I actually just read a quote the other day that I think every 36 seconds, somebody dies from cardiovascular disease in our country. Wow. Yeah. And I think across the world, it's like one in five people die from cardiovascular disease, right? So uh, that's a huge problem. But if you can actually get to the centers that are the most experts in it, or at least if you can find somebody close to you or, or what have you that will work with you directly and you know, will, you know, kind of jives with you rather than being mandated into these tiny, narrow networks yeah. that insurance companies r r make you go to so that they can make more profits. You know, that's, that's huge, right? I mean, ultimately you have to have a relation. It, it goes back to, you know, kind of what Janet mentioned about, you know, kind of that 1980s earlier medicine, that relationship based medicine where your doctor actually knew you and, and knew, you know, kind of more about your life and about your, about your health and had more time to spend with you. And that's that's what the one of the biggest things that corporate medicine has kind of miscombobulated because, you know, basically it's a numbers game in corporate medicine. Right. So the, you have to get on the, as, a, as a clinician to, to make profit. You kind of have to get on the hamster wheel and just try to try to produce as much volume as you possibly can for the for the corporation. And, and that's not in the best interest of the patient because you're getting a 10 or 15 minute max visit where you should probably have 30 minutes to an hour to truly kind of understand and, and go through, you know, whatever you can possibly do to, to prevent having problems, right? So that's kind of that catastrophic stuff. Again, sharings are great. I mean, Zion's great, Sedera's great. There's a couple other ones out there that are good too, but, um, you know, level funded plans and, and self-funded plans are more for businesses, which certainly, you know, to some extent, when you think about this, uh, a lot of the folks that we try to work with are, are entrepreneurs or small businesses because they actually have the power of choice, right? Because mm -hmm. unless you're going to take the information that we give you and you're going to go to your employer and say, hey, you know, you need to look at this stuff and, and try to advocate for yourself with your employer. You know, a lot of your employers, employers, especially the bigger ones, they lock you into whatever choices they, they offer you, right? So you don't have that power of choice as an employee a lot of times which is unfortunate, but I think that hopefully we can change that with time by working on these employers. Um, you know, again, then beyond that, I mean, I think direct primary care, again, going back to the first pillar actually helps with the third pillar, which is, I mean, the, the four main things that people get kind of robbed on for prices is, is images, labs, medicines, and transport. And at least three of those, you can probably get wholesale prices with your direct primary care. So medicines, labs, and, and images, and, and again, I, I think the biggest warning sign I could tell anybody is never, ever go to a hospital for images or labs or medicines if you don't have to. If you're not there for emergency care or you're not admitted, absolutely find somewhere else. Find an independent radiology place or an independent lab or an independent pharmacy and go get that, that stuff from them and not go to the hospital because, again, they inflate the prices so much. I mean – you know, the, your standard CT scan, 350 bucks, 500 bucks across the country. I've seen horror stories of 10,000 or $13,000 for, for these same images at hospitals. And so, you know, they jack up the prices so much. And, and that's, again, huge problem for patients. So, you know, never, ever do it if you don't have to. If you're, if you're not already in the emergency room or you're not admitted, it's not a reason to be, not a reason to do that. Um, you know, Again, the fourth pillar is really kind of HSAs, HMAs, right? So HSAs, health savings account, a lot of people know about them, although there's not a lot of folks that are actually using them across the country. I think it's like maybe somewhere around 40 or 50 million now, which is still pretty low. Uh, but they can, they can quite honestly, I think an HSA, the, the good thing about them is it's tax deductible money, right? So it goes in pre-tax. So you actually can kind of save some of your money that way. But to a large degree, it's dollar for dollar when you're spending it, although if you spend it for medical care, there's, there's no taxes that are applied, but it's dollar for dollar coming out as it goes in. So quite honestly, I mean, it would be, there's, there's a great opportunity with an HSA to actually save money for retirement. You know, families can, can uh, file away about $7,600. I think individuals are like 3650 or something like that as of 2022. Mm. 
And, and you know, if you, if you add that up over the years, the, the, the beauty of the HSA is it's, it's triple tax free, right? So it's tax free going in. You can actually invest it in the stock market or, or other options and you can actually grow that money uh, uh, through the years. And then it's, it's tax free coming out as long as you spend it for medical care or alternatively, once you hit 65, it actually, you can spend it on anything and, and you can actually use it as a retirement account. The only caveat to that is you do get taxed based on your income if you spend it for other things other than medical care. But even so, I mean, even if, you, even if you're able to save up $100,000 in an HSA over the, the course of your younger years, and you have that available for medical care as you're older, and we already talked about twenty to thirty or two hundred and thirty to three hundred forty thousand dollars for the average couple in their Medicare years for out-of-pocket expenses, right? So that's a great way to do that. I think um, personally, uh, I think the HMA is a is a better out-of-pocket accelerator. It's basically a prepaid Visa card, which you you prepay the the, the contributions monthly over the course of about three years. It actually the value of it actually doubles, and so you know you pay in you know shy of you know twenty thousand dollars, and you end up with forty thousand dollars, which you can use for yourself, your spouse, and any dependents under um, under twenty six for all your out of pocket costs. And so then you're actually paying half off for anything that you're paying out of pocket at that point, uh, and then you can kind of re recharge it up throughout the years if you use it. So that's a nice way to to kind of really kind of take advantage of some of the financial accelerators are out, that are out there and, and truly kind of save yourself some money as, a, as an individual or a family. So, so think, let's clear this up on HMA. How does it double yeah. over three years? So it's, it's, actually, uh, it's actually just an account that's been created by actuaries from Millman. So it's not, it's not invested. It's not anything like that. But it's, it's basically the value of the account is the 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 utilization and and such like that is is such that they can the actuaries have determined that they can allow the, your 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 value of your account to double over over three years and so it's it's not an investment it's 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 basically just kind of a a, a financial accelerator tool that can be used the only the only caveat to that is that there is no cash value to the account once you put uh, the money in right okay so, okay. The money is the money is sunken as a cost once you put it in, but the value of it essentially doubles, and you can use it for anything that you would use, you know, for your out of pocket costs. You get a little, you know, a little Visa card, prepaid Visa card from them, and and basically you can use it from your chiropractor for your labs for anything that you would otherwise, you know, pay out of pocket for copays and that type of thing uh, for your medical care. Interesting. Okay, I, I I wasn't pivoting that information. That's that's great, Dr. Wallen. Um, so there's one more. There's a fifth. There's a fifth thing uh, <laughs> pillar that you that you like to talk about. What is that? Yeah. So the fifth pillar is really just avoiding the system at all costs, right? I mean, the the best way. I mean, health. I would argue that health and time are probably our most valuable assets. I mean, money is money is just a tool, right? And and you know, from that standpoint, health and time are our most valuable assets in our in our short time here on Earth, and you know, from that standpoint, trying to do whatever you can to be heart healthy and, and get your movement in every day, you know, 30, 30 minutes of cardiovascular activity at least five days a week or more, you know, and even if that's just a, a walk for 30 minutes, I mean, that's still better than being sedentary, right? And, and re- actually right now, I'm standing as we're having this, as we're having this conversation, right? And so there is a decent, I mean, we, we, especially in the corporate world, in the business world, we spend a lot of our time sitting yes. and there is there is a significant amount of uh, data that does show you know certain risks from from a cardiovascular standpoint even potentially some association with colon cancer and also remember the number one thing that that actually keeps people from getting to work uh, from a medical standpoint is musculoskeletal problems and sitting is not we're not designed to be sitting at desks all day long and, and hunched over keyboards and you know this type of thing, and so anything you can do to either get a standing desk or, or what have you, to you you certainly burn more calories by the hour when you're standing, just standing alone, right? And so that's that's a huge thing, you know. Even even making sure you're getting you know good rest. Uh, I don't know if you've if you've seen it at all or heard about it, but uh, Tony Robbins came out with a new book called Life Force, and he was talking about uh, the he. It's I think he interviewed like 167 Nobel laureates and scientists and. And medical doctors and such, and he was actually talking about the, what they. One of the things they talked about was with the um, 
with the time change, right, the uh, daylight savings time, there's actually something like a 21% increase in cardiovascular problems uh, following when we lose an hour of sleep in the fall, or no, sorry, in the spring, spring forward, right? So yeah, right. when we lose an hour of sleep, just losing one hour of sleep, you there's you know 20 25% increase uh, in cardiovascular events in people during the the week afterwards and and one of the other things that they they um you know talked about that that really struck me was that you know I know you and I both believe in in hormone optimization you know testosterone estrogen progesterone thyroid what have you but they actually showed that if the I mean optimal sleep is is 7 to 8 hours a night right you probably best served between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. But uh, they actually showed some data that if you, if you uh, just spend one week and get four to five hours of sleep a night, you actually have hormone levels of somebody who's 10 years older than you. And so just that alone is, is a significant thing, right? But also, you know, again, let's talk about, you know, making sure you're drinking enough water, right? I mean, I, I, talk, about, I talk about that all day long with my patients as a urologist, especially, sure. especially <laughs> kidney stone patients. Uh, and, and, you know, again, we live in Florida here, but I mean, from, from North Carolina to California is what's known as the stone belt because people don't drink enough water throughout the country in general, let alone we're in these places that are hot and humid and you sweat more and what have you. And so typically at least half your body weight in ounces of water a day, but you have to be careful where the sources are too, right? Because a lot of our drinking water is potentially contaminated. And so, you know, whether you have a filtration filtration device on your home unit or use some type of filter to kind of uh, get out some of these heavy metals or what have you. Uh, and, and I would caution, you just have to be careful, certainly with bottled water. You know, I think Dasani and some of these other ones have classically been known to just be tap water from somewhere else right. in the country. So they're, they're, bottled water isn't the best thing in the, in the planet either, right? And so that's, that's important. But, you know, also, I mean, thinking about regeneration and, and that type of stuff, I mean, our body heals the best when we have, you know, the best nutrients. And, and I think anybody who's not near, not near the water and doesn't get, you know, a fresh supply of seafood or, or, or fish in general, you know, probably should be on an iodine supplement. And, and certainly, you know, I think vitamin D has been kind of, you know, touted for COVID, but it is a, it's a great supplement for our immune system. And I think quite honestly, optimal levels of vitamin D, I think there's a lot of experts that actually argue that, 60 to 80, or if you had a history of cancer, maybe 80 to 100 uh, in, in units would be actually better than, than what we typically classify. And I think in, in conventional thinking, you know, 30 to 60, we thought was the, the sweet spot, but right. I think we're finding that the sweet spot is higher and, and those optimized levels are, are a bit higher than that. And, and that's certainly important too, right? And so, you know, making sure you're getting all that stuff done. I mean, certainly there's a lot of folks out there with you know, GI problems, you know, the microbiome of the, the gastrointestinal tract mm -hmm. is very, very important and supporting that with probiotics. And, and I think the other thing, you know, uh, what inflammation I think has been a big driver of a lot of problems, whether it's arthritis, whether it's GI problems, whether it's cardiovascular problems, one of the biggest things you can do to help yourself with that is, is, you know, try to stay away from the anti the, the, or the inflammatory compounds that are out there and certainly trying to, you know, take in lots of fruits and vegetables, you know, certainly uh, I'm not going to list them off for you, but there's the dirty dozen as far as fruits and vegetables to stay away from as far as high volumes of pesticides like strawberries and some other things there. But, and there's the, there's the clean 15 that you can kind of pay attention to and you can look these up and, and try to try to, you know, work around these things. And, and if you have to get a, get organic, and, and even with your, your beef and, and what have you and chicken and such, you know, certainly staying away from the antibiotic loaded stuff because that certainly all affects your microbiome of your gut yeah. and, and affects your health and your ability to absorb nutrients that way. Um, remember, we are, are at a cellular level. They're, they're, from a regenerative standpoint, uh, regenerative medicine, the, the, they really focus on kind of cellular and cellular signals, right? And so a lot of the communication that happens in our body is electricity. It's electricity going down the nerve fibers to tell our, our fingers what to do and what have you. And, and a lot of our diet actually acidifies us. And remember, most of your batteries out there are alkaline, right? So you want to have more of an alkaline diet than you do an, an, acid, an acid diet, which 
you know, to some extent, coffee, alcohol, a lot of these things, you know, even just kind of like white grains and whatnot, a lot of these things, sugars, they, they certainly acidify the body. But if you want to try to kind of counteract that or reverse it, you're talking about things like fruits and vegetables that they are great at alkalinizing the body. Um, even, you know, like celery juice, a lot of people, there's a kind of a fad of, of folks using celery juice. Uh, beyond that, though, like even just using, I mean, one of the common things we do for kidney stone patients, again, is to alkalinize the body to try to prevent acidified stones. And what we tell people to do is, you know, four ounces of, of citrus juice every day. So whether it's lemon juice or lime juice, I, I usually stay to, say to stay away from grapefruit or, or orange because they have so much sugar in them. Yeah. But even just mixing them in your water and flavoring your water with lemon juice or lime juice that can be great for your system to kind of alkalinize and, and, you know, try to recharge your energy. And so that's, that's, I think a huge thing. I think beyond that though, one of the biggest things I've learned from Tony Robbins is, is just the mindset piece and, and the psychology of the, of the world. Right. And I think that psychology, you know, he always talks about psychology is about 80% of business or success, right. The, the rest is, you know, kind of, the, the organic stuff, but the psychology is so important. And I think unfortunately right now in our, in our world, you know, th there's, there's so much negative news, negative, whatever, you, whatever content you want out there that could be out there to consume is, is so negative. And that certainly, I mean, uh, the, I think the CDC lists itself as, you know, beyond the, the four most common comorbidities like uh, heart pathology, lung pathology, uh, diabetes and, and obesity, I think, uh, anxiety and fear was one of the bigger drivers of, wow. you know, potential COVID problems. Right. And so, you know, again, controlling, uh, it's that old saying garbage in garbage out. Right. So if you're putting garbage in here, you know, you're, it's yeah. going to, it's going to produce garbage in your, in your body. And, and same goes with your, with what you intake from a oral standpoint, from your mouth, from your, from your water or your, or your fluids or, or your, the food that you eat. Right. And so, that is, I think, something that, you know, people are starving for is, is truly kind of that, that uh, to, to be able to take back their power from a, from a psychology standpoint, which I think is so, so important. Absolutely. And, you know, you there's a lot more. There's a lot more. For sure. For we sure. Talk about it forever. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And thank you for all that. That's, um, you know, I know when I, I know when I first, I knew when I first met you that you were a different kind of doctor and, you know, how many urologists know about gut health and, and just healthy body in general. And so I appreciate what you do. Um, it's obvious that you care about your patients and that's why you're doing something different because you want to show that you want to educate and empower them and you want to show them how they can, you know, access good medical care without bankrupting themselves. I mean, that's that's very powerful. And I think, honestly, when you take an oath of medicine, when you take that Hippocratic oath, I think that's part of it. I mean, really, if a doctor is bankrupting a patient by by doing some procedure that they know is going to be $50,000 and the patient can't cover it, um, you know, is that violating the Hippocratic, is that violating the Hippocratic oath? You could argue it possibly is, for sure. Yeah, I mean, and, and I know you know him well, Keith Smith. I mean, he he's commonly quoted as saying, you know, how can you take an oath to do no harm and, and then allow a patient's life to be financially ruined, right? And right. and I think that also goes to I mentioned earlier in the in the show that you know to some extent my colleagues don't always necessarily under the understand the price, and I think that's so so important. If again, if you're going to prescribe something or or recommend a surgery or what have you, understanding the price. I mean, heck, I even had a patient uh, who he only had Medicare A, right? So he didn't have uh, outpatient coverage. All he had was inpatient coverage from Medicare A. He didn't have Medicare B. And so we were talking about doing an outpatient surgery and the hospital wanted to charge him $20,000 for a cash price. And I looked at him and I was like, listen, I know for a fact that at, at an outpatient surgery center, I could do that, that surgery for less than $10,000. And so again, that just shows you if, but if you don't, if you don't even know that information internally right. or, or seek out that information as a clinician, then to some extent, it makes it very difficult for you to kind of advocate for your patients in the, in the truly grand scheme of things, which, you know, again, at, at the end of the day, uh, the only, the only value exchange in medicine is between a, a clinician and a healer or a clinician and a patient, sorry. And so from that standpoint, you know, trying to, really truly understand the not only the the best options out there but also the financials of that and and what you know how the patient can survive or or 
you know, kind of deal with that on their side. Again, that, that goes back to having that relationship, having that time to understand, you know, what your patient's financial feasibility is and, and kind of trying to work with them to find the best solution that, that works for both. Cause you know, if, if I, if it's, it's kind of like the same thing as, you know, for me, like, you know, a lot of the stuff that we do is not urgent, you know, outside of the, outside of a few, five things that are, that are kind of true urologic emergencies. A lot of the stuff that we do is elective. And I always tell patients, I'm like, listen, I want to, I want to know from your cardiologist and, and saying that we can stop these blood thinners and, and saying that your, your heart is healthy enough to do this. You know, especially even we talk about guys who are on four liters of oxygen and want to have a surgery because they have a catheter and they don't want to live with the catheter for the rest of their life, however long it is, which I understand. I, I wouldn't want it. So yeah. I, I understand that. But at the same rate, I always tell them, I'm like, listen, if I try to do a surgery to, to get you free of this catheter, but you end up dying on the table, that's not helping you very much. And it's the same thing. If I try to do a surgery and you're left with a $50,000 bill and going to collections and, and bankrupt, you know, I'm, I'm what there's $500,000 or 500,000 bankruptcies in the United States that are majority due to medical bills a year. And I think and let's, let's, let's add to that, that most of those people have insurance. I was just going to say 60 oh. plus percent have insurance, right? right? So, I mean, that's, that's crazy that, I mean, again, I, I describe it as the United healthcare syndrome, which is a spinoff of Stockholm syndrome, where Stockholm syndrome is this kind of syndrome where it's a, psych, a psychology syndrome where uh, say, for instance, you're, you're in a bank robbery and you kind of essentially, or you're, you know, you're held captive in some situation, you basically develop kind of a psychological bond with your captor, right? And so I think United Healthcare System for, or Syndrome for me is, is basically everybody thinks that a health insurance card is going to take care of everything for them, right? They think they can just, and I know you've done videos on this comparing it to, to automotive industry and the hotel industry and et cetera, which I would encourage people to watch because they're, they're amazing and hilarious, but <laughs> it's so true. I mean, you know, what the Wall Street Journal article of uh, March of, uh, I think, 21 now, so two marches ago, they talked about at the exact same hospital in California, you could get charged $6,000 or $60,000 for the exact same service. And so that'd be like going, d depending on which insurance you, you card you gave them, right? So that'd be like going to McDonald's, not knowing the price, not have, you know, all it says is market price up there. Or if you ask them, they won't even tell you what the price is. Right. And basically, you know, depending on which which credit card you laid down, your cost would be either six dollars for your cheeseburger or sixty or sixty sixty dollars for your cheeseburger, and you don't know until three or four months later when they send you the bill. Right? I mean, it's crazy, right? <laughs> it so, is crazy, and we let it happen, and it's legal. But yeah. you have outlined <laughs> some ways to get out of that system, so that's what I appreciate. Instead of just complaining about the problem, you're doing something about it and educating um, consumers to be empowered to take charge of their own healthcare. So thank you so much, Dr. Wallen. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's so important and I know you do too. It's, it's, it's so important for, for cons uh, people, lay people, patients to become consumers again of medical care and, and force these hospitals and systems to play into that or finding other options and, and voting with their feet, so to speak, voting right. with their money yep. and going, going elsewhere because there's certainly plenty of, of folks out there, you know, again, uh, as a, as a physician, as a healer, you know, I can actually, uh, decrease my cost of your visit basically by 30 or 40% just by accepting your cash payment. Yeah. And so from that standpoint, I can, I can give you, you know, a portion of that discount or, or a large majority of it and make it, you know, easy for both of us. Right. And so that's where, you know, that's where the greatest value is finding an independent healer and paying directly to them without anybody else, without any middlemen like insurance companies, without, you know, your pharmacy benefits managers that are jacking up prices of medicines all over the place. And, and that's, that's the holy grail. But again, you know, unfortunately, if people don't know about it, they can't take advantage of it. And that's where, you know, I, I, I respect the heck out of what a lot of these folks in the free market medical association and, and what have you are doing across the country. But I just think that the movement will be so much more successful if, if patients meet us in the middle and yes. they truly understand how they can meet us in the middle, which is exactly what we try to do is try to help them understand how they can do that, save money and get the highest quality care in the, in the, across the country. So it's obvious that you have a passion for this subject, Tim, just like you do to, as you practice um, urology. 
um, on patients. Um, so if patients have more questions, what is the best way to get a hold of you? I know you have a website that's in development, but tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so selfdirectedmedical.com is uh, is out there. It's it's uh, We're redeveloping it. Uh, it's kind of uh, generic right now, but it'll be redeveloped soon. Uh, also, I mean, you can email me directly at jared at selfdirectedmedical.com. Uh, that's an email that I monitor directly, so you can always get in touch with me there. Also, you know, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, and, and YouTube, we all have channels for, for self-directed medical on all of those as well. So those are easy ways to get in touch with us and follow along and, and interact. And, and, you know, we've, we've run a couple of different uh, beta testing as far as the best way to deliver the educational content. We have a, about a six-week course that's ready to go if, if folks are interested in that uh, called Beat the Insurance Game. And we're also running uh, a kind of a, a free content, which is um, uh, Healthcare 101, the cheat codes, right? So it, it dives a little bit deeper into some of the things that we talked about today as far as how you can go about, you know, kind of beating the game, right? It's kind of like just like the old Sega Genesis, you know, up, down, left, right, whatever, you know, <laughs> trying to get the cheat codes to, to truly to truly kind of beat the game. Because otherwise, again, the game is stacked against us and and – you know, I don't. I don't expect people to understand a lot of this stuff by themselves. I mean, I, I certainly don't. But I mean, if we can deliver them the the cheat codes to to kind of beat the system, yeah. that's that's where we can really take back our all of our power. Because if if we can get patients free of the system and clinicians free of the system, working together directly, I mean, that's where the cheap the the highest quality, lowest cost care will be found throughout the country. Absolutely. Period. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your time and your knowledge today. Um, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. I'm looking forward to uh, talking some more clinical stuff in a, in a few weeks um, uh, on our podcast. And um, as always, Dr. Wallen, thank you so much. Thanks for fighting for, for your patients. Um, I really appreciate it. I wish more doctors did the same thing. So thank you so much for being on. Thank you, listeners and viewers, for tuning in to Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. You can always find me on our Moses Lake Professional Pharmacy YouTube site. Site, please subscribe to our YouTube site so you don't miss any episodes. Also, we are streaming live on Twitter and on LinkedIn now, so don't miss us there. Um, follow me there and um, my personal Facebook page. So thank you for tuning in. Health Solutions with Sean and Janet Needham. Thank you so much. Yeah.